Hey everyone, this is Bill Hilton, author of How to Really Play the Piano, and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today I'm talking with Bill Hilton, author of How to Really Play the Piano, and the host of a hugely popular YouTube channel where over 120,000 people tune in to watch his video tutorials. As always, when we have a guest who specializes in teaching a particular instrument, this episode is packed with tips and insights, not just for that instrument, but for your musicality in general. In particular, Bill has great wisdom when it comes to the mindset that adult learners need in music. In this conversation, we talk about the missing pieces that hold pianists back from feeling creative and expressive on piano, and how to really learn to play, how becoming an amateur singer made him a better piano teacher, what defines cocktail piano and why this style is so popular and so useful to learn, and the surprising advantages that can actually make it easier for adults and retirees to learn an instrument than children. Bill's attitude and his teaching cut right to the heart of what really matters in making music. And as someone who's interested in expanding their musicality, I know that you're going to really enjoy this conversation. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Bill. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Christopher. I'd love to hear a bit about your musical background. We know that now you're the host of a very popular YouTube channel all about how to play the piano. But what did your early music education look like? Was piano your first instrument? It was. And my early education was very traditional on the piano. I started piano lessons when I was eight years old. I had already actually learned a little how to read music like a lot of kids in the UK I'd learned recorder at primary school so I went into my piano lessons aged eight knowing you know the sort of every green bus drives fast and stuff how to read treble clef um and and that was it and I kind of had the journey that that kids and boys especially typically have uh, when they start learning to play the piano which was I sort of dived into it and then kind of got bored and after the first year, I was sort of slipping. I was, I had the arguments with my mum and dad about wanting to carry on or whatever. Um, but then I kind of hit lucky because when I was 12, purely by chance, purely on the back of a piece I played in a school concert, I was invo- invited to join my school jazz band. And that kind of dragged me into the world of jazz piano, of thinking about you know, chords and chord notation, all that kind of stuff that you don't learn in classical piano lessons. So it, it was it was kind of a journey with two parallel paths, if you like. Does that make sense? Mm. So did you continue with the classical then once the interest in jazz yes. picked up? Yeah, absolutely. I continued on my classical lessons, I think, until I was um, 16 or 17. I had a break. Then I went to, when I went to university, I did music as a, a minor subject at university. My main subject was English literature, but I, I carried on music as a as a minor subject. So although, um, and then actually qualified as a, an English and music teacher. So I've done quite a lot of the formal route of music education, if you like. Um, but as I say, at the same time, I've always had, since I was 11, 12, 13, had this kind of kind of the informal side going on, the jazz, and then later on the rock and the pop and the blues and and, and so on. So at a very early stage, for example, I was learning about things like improvisation. And also I was getting, I think this is really important, I was getting experience of playing in front of people, you know, playing at gigs, because, you know, our band would go out and play gigs. Um, So, yeah, it it was quite an unusual journey, Um, And one that really has continued throughout my life, because I still do classical stuff every now and then. Um, But if you like, the the two sides kind of, sometimes they fight with each other, and sometimes they feed off each other. And through this, were your teachers and your parents supportive of you juggling these two? Because I I think a lot of kids, they would switch from one to the other, rather than Mm. try and maintain the interest in both. 
I, I was extremely lucky in that my parents who are not musicians themselves have always been very good at saying, look, do whatever, as long as you're working hard, as long as you're doing your best, we don't care. And I was lucky to have uh, an excellent set of uh, music teachers, both my, uh, my piano teachers, my childhood piano teacher, my university piano teachers, my school music teacher, and then the teachers who ran my, um, my various bands at school. And, and and the older students that, that you know, obviously I associated with and I learned a lot of stuff from. Um, everyone was very supportive. And I didn't get, and I know some people do get this, but I didn't get the, oh, no, you shouldn't be doing that. That's a waste of time. From from kind of either end, if you like. Um, in particular, I was, um, I could name any number of teachers who, who have been really, really influential on me. But in particular, my school music teacher, who was um, a guy called David Wright, who's still very much alive. He was also the organist at, at Boston Stump in Boston, Lincolnshire, where I'm from. And he inculcated in me from a very early age this idea that kind of, you know, all music is equal. Yeah, obviously, you know, some individual pieces are better than other individual pieces, but, you know, you can't look down your nose at one style and venerate another style. You have to listen to a piece of music and judge it on its own terms. And and that attitude kind of rubbed off on me quite early. Cause obviously when you're a kid, you, you develop your little loyalties to, you know, whichever band or whichever style of music you're interested in. Um, but having that kind of attitude drilled into me, you know, it doesn't matter who's done it, judge it as music kind of, kind of smeared across the divide, if you like you know between the, the 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 two traditions that i was working in um so really i was lucky i was incredibly lucky looking back i think that's such a valuable lesson and i have to confess it was probably only in my 20s that i came to that realization myself you know that it's it's not that some genres are cooler or better than others mm-hmm. and i i like yourself i was lucky to have a bit of classical in my music education growing up so i'd never kind of felt like that was off limits or that that was the only option mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it certainly took me a lot of time and and actually a lot of exploring my musicality to realize that there's value in every genre, you know, and mm-hmm. if you're a good listener, you can find mm-hmm. value in almost any piece of music. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So how did you find those two strands developed you as a musician and how you thought about musicianship? Um, it was, I think it was quite a long while maturing. The, 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 the kind of two, you know, mixed together at an early stage, but it was quite a long time before they bore fruit. Uh, in, in that I, w- I was kind of, um, I kind of had this musical split personality through my teens in that sometimes I'd be doing the classical stuff and sometimes I'd be doing the jazz stuff and very often never the twain would meet. Um, what particularly kind of started to bring them together was when I was 16 or 17 and I became interested in songwriting and composition because I thought it was cool. You know, it was, it was a good way of, you know, sort of impressing the girls at parties, you know, Hey, I listened to this song I've written, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. And, and, and so I think it was the, in, in the creativity when I was using my sort of harmonic knowledge, my kind of informal harmonic knowledge from jazz band and the pop groups and the rock bands I was in, I'm bringing that to meet my ideas about classical structure and form and phrasing and melody and all of that stuff I was learning in piano and theory lessons. Um, that's kind of what brought them together, I think. So it, 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 creativity was the spark, if you like. Mm. And um, apart from your piano focus, were you up to anything else in music that was helping you to explore that creativity? Yeah, one or two things. Um, so in my teens, I, I learned um, a variety of other instruments and never became that great. So I played, um, you know, I had guitar lessons. And was okay. I have a funny, um, if you ever see me play the piano, you'll, you'll, you'll notice it, but I have a funny bone structure in my arm, which actually makes it quite difficult to play the guitar, but I, you know, I did okay. And I learned a few brass instruments and yeah, they, they kind of informed my understanding, but it was all about piano later on. And actually, um, towards the end of my time at university and, and then as an adult, really, I also got into choral singing, um, which, has been another big strand of my musical life and which has really had quite a strong influence on me. Um, not that I'm very good. Um, I'm, in fact, no, I'm, I'm, a fairly, I'm a fairly ropey singer, actually. 
Uh, but I always get into choirs because I'm a tenor, and tenors, as, as you may know, are in pretty short supply. Um, but that has had, beyond, hugely beyond what I would expect, has had an influence on my musicianship and has, for example, helped me to improve my sight reading, helped me to improve my piano skills, purely through ear training. Um, one of the big, one of the big things I, one of the things I make a big deal about in my uh, tutorials on YouTube is this idea about using your ear. You know, people think there's a um, a split between playing the piano by ear or playing from music. And, and actually there's not because your ear informs everything you do. And a, a classic mistake of piano learners in particular is not to listen to the sound they're making, which sounds ridiculous because, you know, how, how can you not hear what you're doing? But on the piano, the instrument makes the sound for us. So all you have to do is press the key and out the sound comes. So it's almost easy to focus so hard on what keys you're pressing and in what order you're in and whether you've got the right finger on them that you lose focus of the overall musical effect. And that, that's not a problem that affects singers, for example, because they have to listen to themselves. It's not a problem that affects string players or brass players. Everyone who makes their own note generally isn't affected by that. But pianists in particular can really benefit from singing because it teaches you to kind of listen to music while you make it. Am I making sense there? Does, Absolutely. Does, does that ring bells with you? It, it yeah. does. And I think you've described the trap that a lot of pianists fall into, which mm. is kind of becoming a piano playing robot <laughs> as yes, it were yeah, and absolutely I, I think that's what brings a lot of them to musical you is that they feel yeah. like they've got very good at the technique and they can play the mm -hmm. right notes at the right time but mm -hmm. they're very conscious that something is missing and they don't mm -hmm. quite feel like they are expressing themselves in music yeah and, and i think an important part of that is that people are very hung up on the idea and you maybe come across this with, with, with people coming to musical you People get very hung up on the idea that being a good musician is all about being able to do really flashy stuff on your instrument. Whereas what it is fundamentally about is having a musical idea or, or something you want to express and expressing it. And you might express that in a really, really simple way. And you can have brilliantly performed, wonderfully music, musical pieces of music that are dead simple. And you can have things that don't really work that are really complicated, you, you know, so purely being able to play all the notes really quickly or, you know, or lots of complicated chords or to know loads of fancy scales, that's great. But only in, it, it's only great insofar as it serves your kind of overall aim, which is to, you know, have a musical impact on somebody, you know, your listener. Um, and again, it's all, it's all about getting past the process and this is something that adult learners in particular um do tend to focus on there's very much this idea of process and if i do this 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 and this i will become a good piano player or a good guitar player or, or whatever and learning a musical instrument yes it's about that process whatever route you take through the process but it's also so much about developing yourself and developing your musicality and your understanding and your feeling for music because if you don't have that then you can have the best technique in the world and, and kind of nothing will come out you know um in some ways that's that's why i think it's one of the reasons apart from all the sort of um neuroscience reasons it's one of the reasons why it's um kid people who will start learning as kids do have an advantage in that children if, if you've ever taught them tend to be very open-minded that they don't look at the process ahead and say, what will that do for me? They just accept it, you know, um, providing you can get them to practice. So I think one of the things that adults can usefully learn, um, I think one of the essential skills almost is to look at things as if they were a child again and to discover that kind of childhood sense of wonder, that childhood sense of acceptance at things you don't understand you know, I, I've got quite a few comments on the YouTube channel from, from people saying, oh, you know, should you lay, is, is that called a G9 or is it a G add nine? Like, well, <laughs> you might have missed the point there. <laughs> yeah, you might have missed the point. Does it really matter? You know, um, chord notation isn't designed for that level of granularity. Often chords can be ambiguous. Is it a major seventh? Is it a sixth? Um, and, 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 and getting obsessed with those kind of details kind of misses the point of the end result 
it's it's a bit like um, getting too obsessed with gear. You know, um, we, we'll all have come across the phenomenon of, of you know, all the gear, no idea. And what you know, somebody's got all the plugins and and all the keyboards and all the kit, but can't do anything with it. <laughs> can't do anything with them. You know, not to be to be brutal. Um, and it's the same sort of thing. So as I say, kind of rediscovering that um, that inner child, if you like. I think is particularly whatever age you are as an adult learner, you know, that kind of acceptance of, you know, this is the process. It kind of works. That that sounds like a teacher making an argument for, you know, just listen to me <laughs> and do what you're told. And and it isn't. Um it, it, it's very much about um it's kind of a bit zen in some ways. Don't worry about the process. Focus on what's in front of you and focus on your end goal mm. and you'll get there. I love the way you describe that. I think a lot of adults have that strict dichotomy in mind where there are musicians who can just play anything by ear and they were born yeah. with it and that's that. And mm-hmm. there are musicians who don't have talent and they have to just learn mm-hmm. like a robot. And mm-hmm. what I love about your channel and the way you approach teaching is you're filling in that middle ground where you're showing actually, you know, you can be methodical and follow a thoughtful process but get to that kind of creative freedom in music making. Mm-hmm. And it's a spectrum. It's not either or. Yeah. Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. You do, you have to achieve a balance. Yes, a certain amount of technical knowledge is needed. But if you spend all of your time thinking, you know, when you're playing jazz, for example, oh, I'm playing this chord. Now, what scale can I play over it? Then you kind of overload your brain. You, I think it becomes so mechanical that the music, you, you know, either you falter on the keyboard or musically it doesn't work. Whereas if you use your ear as well, if you're sort of, you know, aware of what notes are available to you, but then kind of have that internal melody going on, if you like, that you can follow and that you can pick out. And, and that kind of that kind of sense of musical shaping and musical phrasing. And um, as I keep saying, a musical end result, that's when you're going to achieve very, very good stuff. E- even if your technical skills are not that advanced, you know, it, 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 even I, I come back to this again, again and again and again. But you don't need to be. Um, it's kind of a paradox. You don't need to be a great musician to be a great musician. If, if you sit, I mean, you don't need all that technical skill. It's great if you can get it because that widens the the stuff you can do. But you can have really profound, really moving, um, you, you know, creative experiences just with a few basic skills. Gotcha. Yeah, we're working on our improvisation roadmap in Musical U at the moment. We're just, um, mm-hmm. we've published the first couple of modules, but it, it's very much that spirit because I think improvisation is a great case in point where people mm-hmm. either think it's a gift or you need to be very mm-hmm. intellectual and music theory oriented about mm-hmm. it. And I love the way you just described it. You know, actually it's about, you know, using whatever technique you have, but starting mm-hmm. from your musical idea and can you bring Absolutely. what's in your head out through the instrument. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just like painting. It's, you know, if you're Picasso or whatever, you have a vision and the technical skill, which is important, obviously involves taking that vision from out of your head and putting it on the canvas, but it's no good having a technical skill without the vision, you know, and, and in music, we do tend to have this, um, it's kind of like, you know, the two cultures. In, in, in fact, it's almost like science versus art in academia and stuff like that, but it's, um, you know, there's the classical culture and there's the pop, jazz, rock, blues, folk culture. Um, and people do get stuck in them. So um, I have a very good friend who's head of a mu- head of music in secondary school who is an absolutely first rate sight reader. You can put anything in front of him and he will sight read it. And um, I will sit, I will watch him do it and say, you know, how on earth do you do that? It seems like magic. I know it's not magic but it seems like magic. And he will say to me, well, how do you do all improvisation stuff? That seems like magic to me. Um, but, you know, he knows it's not magic. And, it, and, and it, it's different views of the instrument, different different approaches, but you can kind of marry them together. And it's actually, actually when you marry them that you um, achieve some of the most interesting stuff. So, you know, some of the great jazz pianists, Oscar Peterson is a fine example, were um, J.S. Bach obsessives. You know, P- Peterson will play, uh, you know, things like Bach's French Suites and the uh, the Goldberg Variations and stuff. And 
that, that you know there were interviews out there with Peterson talking about his relationship with Jazz Bach, um, who he saw as a, a kind of kindred spirit, a fellow improviser, just in a slight different mold and, and that's true because in his day that's what Bach was was best known for for being an improviser but b- because he's old and he's dead and he wore a wig and he's in musical textbooks it's like you know you know enormous formality enormous respect um and, you know because Peterson was kind of hanging out in jazz clubs and stuff it, it, it's almost like, almost like a, a different you know culturally we view those two people differently whereas in terms of the musical things they were doing they were very much the same yeah um, so again, it's kind of about bridging that dis- divide, not just in the world of music, but kind of in our own heads, especially if we are people who have had both the classical education and the, um, y- y- you know, the, the kind of the experience in the world of pop and jazz and so on. So it sounds like from your background, this um, this combination of the classical formal piano technique mm-hmm. and the more free pop or jazz um inspired playing has really Mm -hmm. been a big influence on the pianist and the teacher you've become Mm -hmm. and it sounds like i don't want to put words in your mouth but it sounds like you weren't you know the the born gifted musician who came out of the womb playing um bark chorales in perfect perfect time absolutely um um, do you think that's influenced who you've become as a teacher now yes totally um i am a, a reasonable piano player um being you you'll probably this will probably strike a chord with you but being a musician is a bit like climbing a slope that slopes away from you okay so you can stand at the bottom of the slope and see the see the guy above you who looks like he's at the top but he can see the rest of the slope and he can see how far it is in, in front of him so you know people who don't play or starting to play will listen to me and say whoa that's amazing i know it's not amazing because i can see the difference between me and all those guys who are so much further on um so but, but as you say that's an influence on my teaching it, and in some ways because what i do is educate um it's been an advantage because i know what it's like to struggle i know what it, what it's like to find things difficult this is again one of the reasons i like choral scene because i'm not very good at it the kind of constant pressure is there and you know what it's like to be a beginner you you know what it's like to you know not quite have the the the, you know the 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 sheet music shaking in your hands but oh my word you know i'm two bars away from my entry i don't even know the note so you kind of get that sense and when you can do that it's so much easier i think to express to a learner how to view the problem. Um, whereas I think, well, I know a, a lot of very, very naturally brilliant musicians, and they do exist, struggle to teach. Um, and, you know, to, to go out and take a, take a sporting metaphor, you know, um, John McEnroe doesn't coach tennis and wouldn't coach tennis. He has a tennis coach, and his tennis coach himself is not a world-class class piano player, you know, piano player, <laughs> class tennis player, but rather he's someone who can look at a, a tennis player and say, this is what you need to do. And, and, and that's kind of the difference, if you like. Um, often people who are really brilliant can't imagine what it's like to be in the situation of a learner. Uh, and, and as a good teacher, you've got to put yourself in your student's position. And try to, I know it's very difficult sometimes, but you've got to see, try to see the world from their point of view. It's so important, and I love that for you, choral singing was a way to kind of revisit that beginner's mind Mm -hmm. and put yourself Mm -hmm. in that position, because I think it comes back, excuse me, I think it comes back a little bit to what you were talking about before, where adult learners in particular can get very process-focused and very Mm -hmm. intellectual about it, and Mm -hmm. I think that comes a bit from a defense mechanism that if i just follow the rules i won't have to be exposed as incompetent (laughs) you know because adults we don't like to do things we're not good at you know we're we're comfortable in the stuff we know we can do and it takes it takes guts to put yourself back in that position of okay i don't know what i'm doing it's going to take me some mistakes to figure out my way there yeah and you another an in defense mechanism is exactly the word i was going to use actually ex- exactly the expression i was going to use but so i think another way that kind of defense mechanism manifests itself is when adults start 
you know, are confronted with the prospect of learning to read sheet music. And you come across a lot of people who are learning pop or jazz or blues or whatever, who are dismissive about sheet music and say, you know, oh, great musicians, great musicians don't, didn't, you know, there, there were people out there, wonderfully talented people who never read music. And the example of Paul McCartney always comes up for some reason. And I think probably he can't read at least some, but that's by the by. But what you, you, you see, you only have to scratch the surface a little bit to see that what's actually going on is, um, really they're a little bit nervous of it yeah and um because it's new and it's like learning to read all over again they think you know i don't want to put myself in the position of a five-year-old having to learn to read so therefore i will dismiss the skill as irrelevant um and whereas you know i think it's an immensely useful skill it's the most efficient way there is of you know if you've got a bit of paper in front of you just jotting something down far more efficient than you know people talk about capturing midi data and you know recording ideas and stuff but believe me you know a bit of manuscript paper and a pencil and you can write things down much easily much more easily so it's about if you can i think as an adult learner overcoming the again it comes back to thinking like a child not having the prejudices not having the fears, not having the, um, the the worries about, oh, you know, what will people think of me? How will I perform? Obviously, kids do have those. But when, when kids are in the mo- moment, especially the sort of eight, nine-year-old beginners, they they do just take things on trust. I mean, I, I haven't taught kids for years and years and years, probably 20 years since I taught a nine-year-old. Um, but they are much more open to experience. And that is the sort of mindset excuse me a sort of mindset you need to try and cultivate if you can if you're an adult beginner and even if you're like in your 80s and you know i have people on the youtube channel um come and watch my video who, who will say to me you know thanks very much for these bill i'm just starting out to learn now when i'm 86 and, and you think good on you because you know what you can learn you might not you know maybe get in the 20 odd years of become a becoming a brilliant technician on the piano keyboard, but you can certainly learn enough to have meaningful musical experiences to, to deliver a meaningful musical performance. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's all about um, for those guys in particular, but for adults of all ages, for, um, having that childlike attitude, but also having the faith in yourself to carry on, you know, um, a pretty regular problem, in fact, among our older listeners in particular, and our older viewers of my channel, is I say, oh, you know, I find it slower, it's much harder work, oh, blah, 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 is it going to take me this long, how fast should I be going? And they're all legitimate worries, because as you may know, as an adult, you learn more slowly than if you're a child. Um, to use a technical term, your brain is less plastic, you have, you have less neural plasticity. Um but people forget the second half of that, which is, yes, your brain is less plastic than a child's, but you can learn just as effectively as a child can. It just takes longer. Yeah. Um, so the advantage you have as an adult is that, yes, things take you longer to learn, but you can, you should also be able to apply greater diligence to your learning process because you have more experience, more life experience of you know, being rewarded as a result of being diligent in a task, if you see what I mean. You, you've trained yourself to be diligent far more than eight-year-olds has. And, you know, eight-year-olds need more sort of kind of external motivators. They need their mum sort of shouting at them to do their piano practice or, or, or whatever. So older learners should not underrate themselves. You know, I, I, I don't think, and, and so many do, you know, and, and so many learners, adult learners have this terrible inferiority complex about music and, and really, you know, they shouldn't, hats off to them even for trying to learn, really, you know, e- even taking the decision to do it is is a praiseworthy act, I think. Um, so, you know, nobody should feel hung up about trying to learn a musical instrument. 100% agree. Yeah, I think we've seen the same at Musical U. It's predominantly attitude that matters. You know, they come in worrying, oh, I don't have a gift for music or, oh, I'm, it's too late, I can't learn the physical skills or my brain isn't as quick as it was. But the bottom line is you'll go so much further, faster with that, those drawbacks and the right attitude than yep. a 20-year-old who's just kind of dilettanting their way through it and, yep. you know, has the physical advantages of being young but actually doesn't have the drive or the desire or the dedication to actually succeed in their music. 
Yeah. And, and and those are the people who don't succeed typically. Um, people who come in with that kind of dilettantish attitude of, yeah, I'm, and, and they don't get fast progress or what they think is fast progress, so they give up. And I know those people exist because I'm one of them in, in kind of other <laughs> spheres. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, trying to learn about um, – I've been doing a lot of recording and stuff like, like and trying to improve my sound engineering skills. And yeah, it's, oh, yeah, this is kind of fun. I like playing around with logic and garage band and stuff. And then, Oh, actually this is quite hard work. I'll send it off to a sound engineer, you know, cause I'm not getting the quick results. Um, and I know that if I stuck with it, I would get quick results, but there's a kind of, oh, you know, I haven't got time. I've got, I've got to take a little boy to nursery. I've got to, got to cook the dinner. I've got to do this, that, and the other. The secret to success as an adult learner is is just to make time every day to put your head down, to to be committed to that goal, and and it's not it's not it's not easy because humans are not well adapted. We're we're, we're not evolved to commit to really long term goals. So you know you have to keep. That's why you have to enjoy what you're doing, enjoy the journey. You know, don't see it as a journey with a fixed goal because I'm sure you would agree with me uh, here. Um, as a musician, as a musical learner, I'm still a learner. I'm still on a journey. Okay. The journey never ends. Basically, there's always a way of learning something new or getting better. So while you're on that journey, you might as well jolly well enjoy it. Um, and don't worry if the milestones you're expecting to reach don't come when you, you think they will. Because another thing that you see in all um, learners is that progress typically isn't um, steady. Yeah, it's not linear. It comes in fits and starts. And you can plug and plug and plug away at something for what feels like weeks or months and make no progress. And then suddenly one day it'll be, bang, there it is. Um, And and that's how the human brain works. Eventually the circuit is built that you need and it goes into action. Um, But, you know, so all practice will be rewarded if it is sufficiently rigorous, because that's another something else we can talk about. It's another failing people don't practice properly. Um, if it's sufficiently rigorous, it won't just necessarily be rewarded in a gradual way. I think there were <laughs> several important points there that I would love to dig into and unpack. Um, and we might have to do a, a part two interview in the future to touch on some of these topics. But I I think that message of daily practice is so important. And Mm -hmm. I think that's another secret superpower that the older learners have. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I was surprised at first how many retirees were joining us at Musical Mm -hmm. U and coming to music for the first time in retirement. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. what I gradually realized was they have a huge advantage because they have the freedom of time and energy to do that daily practice. Mm -hmm. And they're not in a Mm -hmm. rush. They're not, you know, cramming it in in 15 minutes after dropping the kids to school. They can, Mm -hmm. you know, really relax into it and enjoy the journey, like you said. Absolutely. And they've learned how to be diligent over their lives. They've learned to endure frustration, if you like. Um, because I mean, just building on what I was saying about practice and an important thing I often say in my YouTube tutorials about practice is that it should be kind of frustrating. You know, if you're just sat there playing through a piece and, and, you know, it's all jolly good fun, then you're not practicing, you're performing. Yeah. Practice, um, is at its best when you're really kind of, Oh, all right, you know, this is difficult. Does this finger go there? And you know, if it really hurts, it's like, you know, it's like lifting weights or whatever. If it really, well, not really hurts, but if, <laughs> you know, if, if it's painful, mm. if it's a struggle, that's when your brain is being forced to adapt. If you find it easy, your brain is just ticking along on autopilot. Yeah. Um, so, so again, um, older learners, I think have a greater, capacity for mental suffering if you like <laughs> you know mental <laughs> effort the, we could say yeah m- mental effort yeah and this is what puts off so many kids in in particular um that they um it's very hard work to start with especially on the piano or a stringed instrument an orchestral stringed instrument and you you seem not to get very many rewards quickly um i personally i would end you know, I have many very good friends who are music teachers and I, I love them all to bits, but personally I would kind of redesign the whole childhood music education syllabus to accommodate some of the more rewarding stuff. Now that's not to say that I would make, I would put sort of rock and roll on the ABRSM piano grade syllabus. Um, 
But I would encourage kids to learn more about improvisation, about composition. I think, you know, the, the day you learn being a, learn, start to learn being a musician is the, the day you start to learn being a composer, or you, you know, you should. Anyone can compose. Um, and all of those things should be part of your musical education. One of the difficulties we have at the minute is kind of breaking the cycle of education, if you like, because most of our music teachers are qualified in not a narrow, that's unfair, but in one particular way of teaching music. Yeah, that read the score, do the you know do the exams, do the the oral tests, all the rest of it. Um, but it would be good to educate kids, you know, to give them the kind of education that I got by accident, really, across a number of skills and genres that would en- enable them to. This sounds really kind of hippie-ish, and it's not. Um, and enable them to kind of express their musicality at a much earlier age. Yes, the discipline is good. Yes, the hard work is necessary. But <clears throat> excuse me, you, you need, as a child, as an adult, to be able to be creative, as well as doing the you know the learning the scales and all the rest of it. Um, because it, you know if you if you're not being creative, then what's the point? You know. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think an eight year old is going to have a lot more fun doing a simple improvisation than perfectly playing the G major scale over two octaves for the umpteenth time. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, There is benefit in learning to play the G uh, G major scale really smoothly and evenly. And, and, you know, that child will reap those benefits further on, but it's not satisfying right there. And then it's not going to get them addicted to playing a musical instrument. So, you know, we kind of have to sugar the pill a little bit more, especially with kids, but as I say, with adults as well. So on that note, then, you know, I think at this point in the conversation, our listeners are going to be clear that you come from a slightly different perspective on teaching music Mm -hmm. and you have a lot Mm -hmm. of insights and wisdom on how to do it differently and in a more enjoyable and rewarding way. You've written a How to Learn Piano book. And I think at the beginning of this interview, people might have wondered whether the world really needs another How to Learn Piano book. But I think maybe the title of the book captures it well, which is How to Really Play the Piano. Can you tell us about that book, where it came from, and what makes it different from your standard beginner piano book? Sure. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is is it's not a book for absolute beginners. Mm -hmm. You need to read, be able to read basic right hand and left hand, uh, treble and bass clef, to use it mm-hmm. but you know someone who's done you know formal lessons someone who's done grade two or something would be fine or I, i've recently done a, a series of beginners videos on it's, it's ongoing on my youtube channel to get people to the standard where they can use the book but where it came from um i had the idea years and years and years and years ago probably hold on what am i what am i now i'm 43 i probably had the idea when i was at university more than 20 years ago but um, back in 2009, I was working in the advertising business and most of my, I was a freelance, most of my clients were banks and financial institutions. And of course, we had the, uh, we had the, the banking crash and lots and lots of my work disappeared overnight. So I had a bit of free time on my hands while I kind of rebuilt that, that, that business and thought, you know, why don't I try writing that book? that I've been meaning to write for ages and almost just to kind of get it off my chest. And, and you know, I self published it and, and all the rest as, as, as I do to this day. Um, and what I wanted to do, it was kind of a, an itch that I had to scratch w- was to the subtitle of the book is the stuff your teacher never taught you is to pass on the stuff that I was lucky to learn in my break times and lunch times and whatever at school and jazz practice um, to those people initially who had had formal lessons and, and they were my target audience. Although people who've never had a piano lesson in their life, buy it and enjoy it. Um, but those are the people I, I was thinking of. And I was kind of annoyed at that stage that, you know, people were going through piano lessons and yes, learning brilliant stuff, but not learning some, you know, just basic things about chords and improvisation, how to read a lead sheet, how to read chord symbols, all of that sort of thing. So um, I, I think what I say in the introduction is, um, you know, one of the things that would have helped me when I was a kid sat in, sat in school jazz practices trying to work out chords to things would have been, you know, kind of a simple book of wisdom, if you like, that just kind of told me I'd written down all the things I needed to learn. So that was the book that I tried to write, how to really play the piano. Um, 
And I never expected it to do very well. Um, and the YouTube channel came off the back of it, actually, because I, I was, um, you know, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll put it on Amazon. A few people might buy it. It, it was more about getting the thing off my chest. Um, when I was writing it, especially some of the more technical stuff, some of the ideas about intervals, for example, I thought, actually, you know, blimey, this sounds complicated, doesn't it? Because that's a feature of music theory. When you read it, it sounds like absolutely insane rocket science. But when you actually put it to work on the keyboard, it, it, it's actually quite simple. Um, you know, when you get let your ears do the thinking. Um, so I thought, I know this YouTube thing has just come along. Uh, I think I've got an account. I'll make a couple of videos. I can suspend my phone above the piano somehow. And just to explain it, and then I can put the links in the book to the videos. Um, and that was that. And what happened is that, and I, it was pure luck that this happened. I thought that people would buy the book and then go to the videos, but it was happening the other way around. People were finding the videos on YouTube and saying, this book sounds cool, where can I buy it? So I thought, cool, make more videos, not strictly related to the book, promote the book a bit more. But then the, the YouTube channel became the main event, as it were. So the book sells very well. It's the big income earner from from the channel. Uh, it gets very good reviews, I'm pleased to say. Um, but it, it's it's kind of an adjunct to the to the to the YouTube channel, which is the main thing. Um, and yeah, so it, it keeps going. I'm actually gradually working on a second edition because I the first edition I wrote not exactly in a hurry but not expecting it to be quite as successful as it was. And um, things were kind of, life was a little bit stressful at the time because obviously business had collapsed and, you know, I was, I was living in a small rainy house in the middle of Wales and stuff like that. So uh, I wrote quite a lot of it in the dark, actually, because <laughs> um, there was an electrics problem in the house and the, 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 the ring main was working so I could plug my laptop in, but we have no lights. Anyway, that's another story. Um, so... There are not major mistakes in it, but just things that, you know, little errors I want to correct and one or two other things I want to drop in, one or two examples I want to change a little bit. So there's going to be a second edition coming out, I hope, in 2018. That might slip. So if, if you're thinking about buying it, don't hold on for the second edition <laughs> because I've, I've got to get it done yet. Um, but there will be a second edition at mm. some point. And before that second edition, can you give us some examples of what's in that first edition? What can people learn in this book that they maybe would be missing out on in their lessons with a teacher? So it's um, the very first thing it tries to inculcate, actually, throughout the whole book is a set of attitudes. You know, obviously there's loads of technical stuff in there, but the attitude, experiment, play around, don't judge yourself. You know, there are no wrong notes. There are just some notes that sound better than others in certain contexts. So it's understanding those attitudes. Then straight on to begin with, it understands the, it explains the concept of, <clears throat> of chords and harmony um, as they apply in particular to jazz, pop, blues, all, all those kind of popular genres, which, as you all know, um, the technical reasons we, we won't go into are harmonically slightly different from classical music. You know, it's the difference between, you know, homophony and polyphony and, and stuff like that. So it, it explains the concept of chords, how chords work in a song, goes through all of the most important chords, the kind of chord lookup charts and stuff. And then it kind of expands into um, learning improvisation. And the, the route the book takes into improvisation is teaching people... 12 bar blues yeah because even if you don't like 12 bar it's i think the easiest format to learn to get over the initial kind of mental barriers if you like because those are what they are they're mental barriers to start with um so it, it takes you through learning improvisation through 12 bar blues then there's quite a lot of stuff about um using lead sheets because a very common pe problem pianists in particular have you go into a music shop and you buy a book of um like pop songs or broadway show tunes or whatever and what you get is a vocal line with chords over the top and a piano arrangement underneath which is almost always useless because it's simplified it's not usually well written some are but most aren't and it just carries the tune rather than being an accompaniment yeah so it's for people who don't want to sing who just want to play the tune so what generally what professionals do and what 
capable amateurs do who understand it is get this kind of material and ignore the piano part and improvise their own from the lead sheet over the top what is an effective lead sheet the melody and the chords so again it's getting people to read piano vocal scores and learn how to read them as lead sheets if you like um then there are kind of loads of resources and stuff um some of which need updating now. Again, one of the reasons for the second edition coming out, hopefully this next year. Um, but loads and loads of different things. And to kind of, not necessarily to tell people everything they need to know, because that would need a book a thousand pages long, but m- more to kind of point them in the, the right direction and give them a little shove. I love you it. What I, mean. I do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mentioned before my early music education was very much on the classical side. I was lucky enough to at least do jazz piano for a couple of years, which opened my mind a little bit. But you've mentioned a few really meaty subjects there that I wish I had learned earlier in piano, particularly Mm -hmm. the idea of thinking in chords or looking Mm -hmm. at sheet music and realizing you can just pick out the important parts and ditch the rest, you know, (laughs) And, and you can learn to have the musical understanding to do that in a sensible way it's not a superpower it's not a cheat it's not a cop-out it's what real musicians do and it's easy or not easy but it's methodical and possible for you to learn yeah i mean if i if people were taught to play the piano as i think they should be played there wouldn't be a market for popular song sheet music because no one would need it Everyone would just work out the tune and work out the chords and 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 play it for themselves according to you know fairly straightforward structures, um, you know and and that's something about really play how to really play the piano really after reading it maybe after watching some of my YouTube tutorials as well you shouldn't really need to go out and buy sheet music, it, you know if you want to play Beethoven yeah you need the sheet music okay but if you want to play like you know Britney Spears or whatever or or, or, or quite a lot of jazz tunes then it will put you on the path to figuring out the melody, figuring out the chords, putting them together and and seeing things as a musical whole with kind of, again, with musical goals in mind rather than just which key to press when, process-driven stuff. So you mentioned jazz there and um, one of your other books is Cocktail Piano particularly, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. I think is a style that listeners might have heard of um, by that name, but they've certainly heard... And I, I loved this book because you take what can seem like a very fuzzy and ill-defined kind of genre or style of mm-hmm. playing, and you break it down in a very clear way. How can you mm-hmm. actually, you know, pick up a piece of sheet music or hear a melody and, and recreate that yourself and build a cocktail piano style arrangement mm-hmm. of it? Can you tell us a bit more about that, how it works? Yeah, so um, I, I was quite kind of amazed, actually, um, so ju- just to define terms, I've, I've got the piano here. I'll, I'll play a bit. Cocktail piano is that very kind of, um, oh, I might need to turn my volume up. Here we go. There we go. Cocktail is that very kind of chilled out, mellow kind of um, lounge music k- kind of style that you might have heard in pubs or at parties or at kind of weddings, things like that. Lots of very kind of jazzy chords, lots of, major seventh and major ninth type sounds those kind of jazzy sounds but also very free and easy there isn't usually a very strict tempo to cocktail um and for many years when i was working doing a lot of work as a piano player i would um play this stuff at weddings basically and cocktail is great for a number of reasons first of all it's very easy to listen to that doesn't mean it's musically unsophisticated because it is musically sophisticated typically but from a performing pianist's point of view you can string it out yeah it's very forgiving you're not going to make many mistakes once you've got the hang of it and you can take a song and make it last for seven or eight minutes if you want to so so really the style is evolved as a a way of you know this poor piano player sat in the corner of the the cocktail bar with a with a sore backside desperately thinking of what to play next yeah it sort of takes takes some of the language of jazz and strings it out and, and also does some, some really interesting stuff to um, to uh, to fit in its environment. So a lot of cocktail uses, you know, the high notes of the piano because th- they will cut through co- background conversation much more effectively. So anyway, I, I, I was kind of interested in cocktail. A lot of people think it's music or elevator music or whatever, and, and it's not really because some of it's really lovely. Um, and so I did some YouTube videos on it. 
Um, I've just done one fairly recently, actually, because it's perennially popular and loads of people were into it. I, you know, I, I was amazed. I thought people would laugh me off YouTube. You know, what, what is this horrible, cheesy rubbish you're playing, Bill? But people absolutely love it, as, as I do. Um, so I thought, I know, I'll write a, a book. And at the moment, it's a, it's only an ebook, an introduction to Cocktail Piano. It's just a PDF download, although I'm going to adapt it for uh, to be a print book as well. Um, slightly less easy because I did it in... Well, for various reasons, I did it in landscape format and stuff like that. Um, but it is a um, just an ebook at the moment, and it goes through, as you say, the various techniques that you use to learn songs in the cocktail style and kind of adapt them and play them on the piano. And it's kind of, I, I, I think the um, cocktail is kind of cool because, as well as being fun in itself, it's a good way of developing your um, understanding of harmony and of improvisation and stuff because it's a very very forgiving style to play because it's um because it, it's so kind of um you know relaxed and chilled out and you can just kind of noodle around yeah um if you make a mistake you can just stop and then <laughs> oh yeah yeah now what i'm gonna do oh yeah i'll do this Um, and because it's so forgiving, it can sound quite impressive quite quickly. You know, you can do lots of cool, lots of cool arpeggios and stuff. Look, look difficult, aren't difficult once you, you know, kind of understood how they work. Um, and, and, and so you can use it as kind of, you can use cocktail as a kind of sandbox, if you like, for learning about harmony, about improvisation, but without the pressure of this metronome beat going on behind you, you know. Um, and people really like it. It is, um, it's been a very popular book. Fantastic. Um, so we've been talking about how you can be more creative, and I, I love that cocktail piano sandbox as a way to kind of explore the options available to you. And mm -hmm. you touched on something earlier when we were talking about your own musical background, which was that you got into songwriting. Mm -hmm. I believe you have a new project underway, which is very exciting, based around this songwriting extension of creativity you know it's kind of one step further than learning to improvise creatively is to actually think in terms of a song structure and putting a final product together can you yeah. tell us about that yeah so i mean i mean as we were saying earlier that by the time this podcast goes live probably uh, these videos will be up on youtube so people can go and look at them right away but um i've always been interested in songwriting the and I've written lots of different types of songs. I've written kind of pop style songs. I've written sort of jazz style songs. I've written songs for a lot of things like you know, school shows, university shows, amateur dramatic stuff like that. Um, the song style that's particularly in, you know, particularly deeply buried in my head is, is the kind of great American songbook style. You know, the, um, the, the verse instruction followed by the AABA structure songs like, um, the lady is a tramp and, and, and things like that, your, your classic Broadway melodies. Um, and I've wanted to talk about songwriting on my channel for a while because it, it, it's related to a, an idea for another book I have, um, um, a book of songs and maybe even a book about songwriting down the line. Um, so I thought what I would do on the channel was write a song from scratch rather than go and dig one out of the attic because I've got loads up there. Rather than dig one, dig one out of the attic, I thought I'd write one, keep all the scratchy old bits of paper that I've written it on, Make and then make a video about about the creative process. I've recorded the song with um, a brilliant singer I know called Morgana Warren Jones. He's actually sort of a, an opera singer. She's me mezzo soprano, um, but we recorded the song. The songs included in the video, um, and then kind of take apart the creative process because even if you don't want to be a songwriter, you can learn an awful lot just from going through that process. And, and make one or two other points on the, on the way as well. So. Um, you know, when you're writing, yeah, it's really easy to go online and spend thousands of dollars, thousands of pounds on kit. Yeah. But when you're writing a song, you know, the most sophisticated piece of technology that you need really is a pencil. You know, <laughs> th 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 that's it. You can have all the plugins and all the fancy bits of software in the world, but it comes back to having that creativity. What you need is the creativity. And if you've got that, then you don't need anything much more sophisticated than a pen and pencil, various bits of free software, you know, to help you out. Um, so that tutorial did that pretty well. There was a follow-up tutorial that um, was basically how to put together a piano accompaniment to the song. So I um, 
I included, I am going to include, get my tenses right here, um, the, um, you know, version of the song with the piano part stripped out so people can play along if, if they want to and, and kind of chords on screen and stuff. Um, and it's just one of the, the ways I want to kind of expand the channel. I want to see if there's a hunger for this kind of thing because, again, it comes back to something I was saying earlier. I think the day you start being a musician is also the day that if you want, you start being a composer or a songwriter. You don't need to be a genius. You know, if you if you can hum a tune in the shower and then just develop the very basic skills to pick it out on the piano and maybe jot it down, you're a composer just as much as Beethoven was, you know? Um, you know maybe not to the same level of complexity, but, you know, you're still doing that fundamental creative process. And, and, and that's kind of the just a new a new kind of trajectory I want to kind of send my viewers off on if I can and, and, and kind of see if they like it. Terrific. I'm so excited to see those tutorials. And I definitely echo what you say about, you know, being a songwriter or a composer doesn't have to be this big intimidating thing that you are taking on. It can be a very natural part of who you are as a musician just for the enjoyment of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that concept of sandbox you mentioned before, I think it's another great sandbox for exploring mm -hmm. your musicality, whether or not you ever record it and let other people hear it. Just the mm -hmm. process of songwriting is so valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's about, um, it's about, yes, understanding the process, understanding the technical skills, but with a musical, with an artistic end result in mind. We're often a bit scared of that word artistic, but that's what we're doing. We're creating art, you know, whether, whether we are, you know, Justin Bieber or, you know, London Symphony Orchestra, we are creating pieces of art and we should not be scared of thinking in terms of that that artistic goal the all the technical stuff all the physical skills all of the knowledge are just tools to get us to that goal yeah they're not ends in themselves all the kit you know you can pay as much as you want for as, as much kit in the world uh, you know you, you know you can spend thousands but the end result must be that that goal and i i think you know um you know because people do say you know oh, should i buy this should i buy that I, I think one of the um it sounds like i'm bigging you up here but i am one of the best things you can buy is education you know music education whether that is from um naturally from me <laughs> whether that's from me or from you guys or from a, a music teacher or, or whatever you know if you're going to spend money on learning how to play a musical instrument, learning a piano, then get a cheap old, you know, beaten up old piano and invest that money, if you can, in in, in learning, whether that's online, whether that's with a teacher, you know, what, whatever. In, in, a really interesting phenomenon of the past few years, I'm going to slightly off topic here, so feel free to cut me, is um, because pianos now especially are so, so cheap, that has driven the demand for the stuff you do and the stuff I do. Because people can uh, can afford to and are happy to pay three four hundred dollars for a, a playable piano, but don't don't want to commit two three thousand per year for the lessons, you know. Um, but as far as you can, you know, if you have resources that you want to expend on music, focus on developing the, the most important resource of, of all, which is your own skill. Wonderful. I think this conversation has just been packed with really valuable and insightful messages for our listeners. And I hope everyone listening has been paying careful attention because I think whether you're a young learner or an adult, whether you play piano or not, so many of Bill's ideas here can have a huge impact on how much you enjoy and succeed in the process of learning music. Thank you again so much, Bill, for joining us today. No problem at all. Pleasure. Really enjoyed it. The Musicality Podcast is brought to you by Musical You. Learn more at musical-u.com. Bill has such a wonderful perspective on what really matters in learning piano, or any instrument for that matter. Let's run through the key points he shared. Bill grew up starting with classical piano, but quite early on was invited into the school's jazz band, and he started exploring jazz, pop, and other popular styles. That combination let him explore and develop his musicality in two quite different contexts. He was also fortunate to have a teacher who passed on the mindset that no genre is better than another, 
From classical to rock to jazz, they all have their value. That encouraged him to pursue all the styles he was interested in, and he didn't feel torn or held back from one in favor of another. He continued learning piano in classical and popular styles, and he explored songwriting, which he found brought the two worlds together. Be sure to check out Bill's new tutorial on songwriting, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Bill later found that becoming a choir singer also extended his musicality in new and interesting ways. And that choral experience also gave him the opportunity to put himself in the beginner's shoes again, and that helped him to remember what it's like for his students to be learning something for the first time. That's something which can be particularly challenging for adult learners. Bill noted that adult learners worry about not being musical from a young age, and they also worry about their brain and their body not learning as fast as they used to. But at the same time, they have the advantage of experience, they're willing and able to put in mental effort, which is what leads to the most useful kind of practicing, They're able to be diligent and consistent and to motivate themselves. And in retirement, they may also have the advantage of a bit more free time available for practice. So being an adult music learner actually isn't necessarily the drawback that some people assume it must be. An important point which came up a few times during the conversation was that Bill strongly recommends trying to always start with the creative output in mind. What is the end result you're looking for musically? The equipment you have doesn't matter, and the level of technique ability you've learned on your instrument doesn't have to be a limiting factor either. You want to start from the musical idea you're driven to share, and then the equipment and the technique are just the means to an end. He also points out that there's not a hard divide between playing by ear or playing from sheet music. In fact, your ear informs everything you play. A classic mistake of piano players is not to listen, Bill says, and so they lose awareness of the actual musical effect of their playing. As well as building up a YouTube channel with close to 200 videos and over 120,000 subscribers, Bill has also found the time to write three books. In fact, the first one was actually the genesis of the YouTube channel because he felt driven to share his insights on how to really play the piano. And after creating video tutorials to accompany the book, he found they were so popular on YouTube that it was actually the videos sending people to buy the book rather than the other way around. How to Really Play the Piano is the handbook he wished he'd been given, and it's designed to reveal the things your teacher doesn't tell you. For example, chords and harmony, how to extract what really matters from complex sheet music arrangements, and play it your way. He teaches improvisation, too, using the classic 12-bar blues structure to give you a kind of sandbox for learning to improvise in a fun and easy way. We talked, too, about the cocktail piano style, which Bill says is another great sandbox for exploring harmony and improvisation, because you aren't locked into the rigid rhythm of a metronome. Bill has also been working on a new songwriting tutorial because he believes that every musician can be a songwriter or composer. It's a natural next step in exploring your creativity. Again, the message was to begin with the musical idea in mind, and then you can use whatever tools and technique you have to express that. Decades of training and expensive equipment are definitely not required. If you're feeling inspired to explore songwriting yourself, then do check out Bill's new tutorial on that topic. Link in the show notes. Thanks for listening to this episode. Stay tuned for our next one, where we'll be talking about the 12-bar blues that Bill mentioned, something that is definitely worth knowing all about, whether you happen to be into blues music or not. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcasts.